friends. Welcome to Reading Through the Gospels with me, Jennifer Colburn. We are in the book of Luke and we are picking up with chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 1. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant request. Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from the unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Then Jesus told the story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sins, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. One day, when, one day some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, they scowled the parents, sorry, scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus called for the children and said to the disciples, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, There's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, Then who in the world can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for people is possible with God. Peter said, We've left our homes to follow you. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up a house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus said, Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans, and he will be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit on. They will flog him with a whip and kill him, but on the third day he will rise again. But they didn't understand any of this. The significance of his words was hidden from them, 
and they failed to grasp what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting beside the road. When he heard the noise of the crowd going past, he asked what was happening, and they told him that Jesus, the Nazarene, was going by. So he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, the people in front of him yelled, uh, yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and ordered the man be brought to him. As the man came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? Lord, he said, I want to see. And Jesus said, all right, receive your, all right, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus praising God and all who saw it praised God too. Chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to the house in great excitement and joy, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. He said a notable, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together 10 of his servants and divided among 10 pounds of silver saying, invest this for me while I'm gone. But his people hated him and sent a de delegation after him to say, we do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I entrusted to you, so you will be governor of ten cities in your re as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a, ma a hard man to take, who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then turning to the other standing nearby the king, uh, nearby the king ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds. Yes, the king replied. And to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. So they, so they went up and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they 
were untying it, the owners asked them, Why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, The Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise in he peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven highest heaven but some of the Pharisees among the crowd said teacher rebuke your followers for saying things like that he said if they keep quiet the stones along the road would burst into cheers but as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead he began to weep how I wish to uh, how I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace but now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your wall, walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifice sacrifices he said to them the scriptures declare my temple will be a house of prayer but you have turned it into a den of thieves after that he taught daily in the temple but the leading priests the teachers of religious law and the other leaders of the people began planning how to kill him but they could think of nothing because all the people hung on every word he said chapter 20 one day, as Jesus was teaching the people and preaching the good news in the temple, the leading priests and teachers of religious law and the elders came up to him. They demanded, By what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? Let me ask you a question first, he replied. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven, or was it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven... He will ask why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, the people will stone us because they are convinced John was a prophet. So they finally replied that they didn't know. And Jesus responded, Then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Now Jesus turned to the people again and told them this story. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to a tenant, to tenant farmers and moved to another country to live for several years. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of the servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers attacked the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. So the owner sent another servant, but they also insulted him, beat him up, and sent him away empty-handed. A third man was sent, and they wounded him and chased him away. What will I do? The owner asked himself. I know. I'll send my cherished son. Surely they will respect him. But when the tenant farmer saw his son, they said to each other, Here comes the heir to the estate. Kill, let's kill him and get this state for ourselves. So they dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do to them? Jesus asked. I'll tell you. He will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. How terrible that such a thing would ever happen, his listeners protested. Jesus looked at them and said, Then what does the scripture mean? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Everyone who stumbles over the stone will be broken into pieces and it will crush anyone it falls on. The teachers of religious law and the leaders, leading priest wanted to arrest Jesus immediately because they realized he was telling the story against them, that they were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Watching for their own, watching for their opportunity, the leaders sent spies pretending to be honest men. 
They tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he would be a, so he would arrest Jesus. Teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right and are not influenced by what others think. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their trickery and said, Show me a Roman coin whose picture and title are stamped on it. Caesar's, they replied. Well then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So they failed to trap him by what he said in front of the people. Instead, they were amazed by his answer and they became silent. Then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. They posed this question. Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife, but no children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will marry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers, the oldest one married, and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died. Then the third brother married her. <laughs> this continued with all seven of them who died without children. Finally, the woman who di also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Jesus replied, Marriage is for people here on earth, but in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they will never die again. In this respect, they will be like angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. But now, as to whether the dead will be raised, even Moses proved this when he wrote about the burning bush. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, he referred to the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead, for they are all alive to him. Well said, teacher, remarked some of the teachers of religious law who are standing there and then no one dared to ask him any more questions. The, who, uh, then Jesus presented them with a question. Why is it, he asked, that the Messiah is said to be the son of David? For David himself wrote in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Since David called the Messiah Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? Then the crowds listening, then with the crowds listening, he turned to the disciples and said, Beware of these teachings of religious law, for they are like to parade around in following for they like to parade around in flowing robes and love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplace and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head table at banquets. Yet they shamelessly cheat widow widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be severely punished. Chapter 21. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Some of his disciples began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. But Jesus said, the time is coming when all these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Teacher, they asked, when will all this happen? When, 
when, what sign will show us that these things are about to take place? He replied, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and saying, The time has come, but don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he, said, then he added, Nations will go to war against nations and kingdoms against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and there will be famines and plagues in many lands and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into the synagogues and prisons and you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you, and everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair of your head will perish, but by standing firm, you will win your souls. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know that the time of destruction has arrived. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. Those in Jerusalem must get out, and those out in the country should not return to the city, for those will be the days of God's vengeance, and the prophetic word of the scriptures will be fulfilled. How terrible it will be for a pregnant woman, for and for nursing mothers in those days, there will be a disaster in the land and great anger against these and this people. They will be killed by the sword or sent away as captives to all the nations of the world, and Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the period of the Gentiles comes to an end. And there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and there and here on earth the nations will be in turmoil perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when all these things begin to happen, stand and look up, for your salvation is near. Then he gave them this illustration. Notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the leaves come out, you will you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass from the scene, this scene until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap, for that day will come upon everyone living on earth. Keep alert in all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. Blessings.